وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد الله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولتكن منكم أمة يدعون إلى الخير ويأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر وأولئك هم المفلحون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we thank him for giving us this existence and giving us this life and considering us worthy to be tested as you know, this life is a world of trials. As I mentioned yesterday in Surah Al-Mulk, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلَهُ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ He it is who created death and life to test which of you is the best in deeds. And he is most, وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ Mighty, forgiving, protecting. This life is nothing but a life of trials and tribulations, my brothers and sisters. I cannot say anything further than that. It's an amazing reality, and if you might doubt this sentence, then go to the graveyards and see the millions of people who have lived on this earth before us, the billions who left us. The population of earth is growing exponentially. There's over 7.5, 7.2, 7.3 maybe 7.5 billion people on earth today. And the numbers are increasing, but all of us have to die. Kullu nafsin Every self will taste death. Kullu man alayha fan wa yabqa wajuhu rabbika dhul jalali wal ikram. Everything will perish except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then why are we here? Why are we here to grow old and die? Why is it that we are weak and then we become strong, and then we become weak, as Allah says, right? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in many ways. Allah الذي خلقكم من ضعف ثم جعل من بعد ضعف قوة ثم جعل من بعد قوة ضعف وشيبة يخلق ما يشاء He it is who makes you, creates you weak, and then makes you strong, and then makes you weak and old again. He wills. Why this bleep on the radar and then we disappear? Whereas there's nothing more important to us than ourselves. While we exist on this earth, we get very annoyed when there's injustice. We get very disappointed when our names are not given the right credit or our lives are not given due. We are annoyed when people are disrespectful to us. Whereas Allah says, Hal ata'ala linsani heenu min dahri لم يكن شيئا مذكورا إن خلقنا الإنسان من نطفة نمشاج نبتليه فجعلناه سميعا بصيرا إن هديناه السبيل إما شاكرا وإما كفورا الله says has mankind not taken حساب هل أتى على الإنسان حين من الدهر لم يكن شيئا مذكورا have you not considered that you, mankind, were not worthy of being mentioned at one time. It's true. Before our birth, we were not worthy of being mentioned. In fact, it would be foolishness to mention us if we have not come into existence yet. And yet, when we come to existence, how important are we? Ask the parents when the child is born how precious this child becomes to their lives, that they change their lifestyles to meet the standards of this new addition in the family. So how important is this being? Extremely important. We get infuriated as a parent when our children are abused, even 
with a touch in the wrong way, isn't it? So why are we so important if we come on this radar as a bleep only to disappear? The only possible answer is that this world is a world of trials. And in this world, Surah, Surah Al-Dahr, Allah says, إِنَّ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِن نُطْفَةٍ أَمْشَاجٍ نَبْتَلِيهِ We made mankind from a clot, that which clings. You know, Imam Ali alayhi salam says it's like a snot that comes out of your nose. You know, it's slippery, it's worthless, and yet it's so priceless. It's so precious, isn't it? The zygote, that which embeds itself in the womb of the mother, that you and I are born through it. And we must ask those kinds of questions. This conversation and these kinds of conversations are very important. For these kinds of conversations give us the vision of why we live on this earth. And life is all about visions. When I talk to my young generation, young brothers and sisters, I always say to them, have a vision. The Western lifestyle, it's not a bad lifestyle. Living in the West is a blessing. Living in Canada, America, the people are beautiful. Opportunities are great. People are intelligent in these societies. They're smart. They're enterprising. They're caring. They're sharing. But when it comes to long-term vision, the system is not fine-tuned. It's out of tune. Hollywood is out of tune. It's confused. See? Dalin, you know? Sirat al an'amta alayhim. Guide us on the path of those you have chosen. Who are these you have chosen? The prophets and the imams. Why? Because they have the fine-tuned vision. They have the practice. They have the proper solutions, the template to bring success for you and me. And we recite this ten times a day if we pray five times a day. Sirat al ladina ihdina sirat al mustaqim, sirat al ladina an amta alayhim, ghayri al maghdubi alayhim, waladdalin. This is fundamental in Islam. The path of those you have chosen, an amta, the ones who have been given special gifts, na'ma. Nobody has received more na'ma and gifts than prophets and imams. This is beyond. Discussion. We all know it. It's Quranic. You see? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times says, Am yahsudun an nas ala ma atahum Allahu min fadl? Are you jealous that we have given mankind certain gifts? Hmm? We gave Ibrahim wa al Ibrahim mulkan azima. We gave them a lot. Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim a lot. These are the ones who are an amta alayhim. When we commemorate the shahad of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he is an amta alayhim. He is the path that we say ten times a day. Sirat al ladina an amta alayhim. Imam Hussein alayhi salam goes to Karbala to show us how to live in this world. What does it mean? He shows us how to pass this exam. He gives us the template and what to do and what not to do. It's a world of trials. And in this world of trials, there are three fundamental groups. The group that is chosen by Allah, the group that invokes the wrath of Allah, maghdubi alayhim, ghadab. The ones who do so bad, the evildoers, the ones who stop progress, the ones who are treacherous, the ones who destroy people's lives, the ones who drop bombs on others unfairly, the ones who knock doors and shoot with impunity, they shoot without caring and they kill innocent children and families that were happy and they go and destroy their lives in one second. We don't realize how treacherous that is because many of us may not have lived it. Some of you probably have lived it. I was in Jamkaran and I met a man from Afghanistan. Just comes out of my mind right now, I'm thinking. He was walking on the streets. We stopped, called him, he says, where are you going? He says, I'm going home. Poor man, old man, in his 60s, 70s. I said, where do you live? He said, behind here. He says, can we join you? 
He said, sure. Went to his house. It's a mud hut, a tiny little mud hut. It was freezing. There was no heat. There was a carpet on the floor, not even a pillow. I asked him, where do you sleep? He said, on the floor. I said, what do you do? He said, I have no job. I do menial work on the streets. <sighs> I feel like crying. He showed me the picture of his two sons. You know? He says, these are my two boys. They were all in their 20s. He says, Taliban came and killed them in front of me. And then they hit me with the butt of a gun on my head and told me, get out, you old man, go. He says, I'm here. I have no wife, no children. I'm living in this mud hut. That's the dhulm of the kind of people who are maghdubi alayhim. The ones who the wrath of Allah is the one Allah promises hell. Hell in the Quran is about these people. When I looked at this man, I said, my God, I cannot empathize with you. I cannot feel that pain. I know how it must be, but there is no way I can feel your pain. This dhulam done unto you for no reason, simply because you belong to a particular group of people and because you love a certain lifestyle. This Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises in the Quran that we will grab them. Hmm? Allah says, we will grab them. Kufruhum ilayna marji'uhum fanunabbi'uhum bima amilu. Inna Allah alimun midhati sudur numatti'uhum qaleelan thumma nadtarruhum ila adabin ghaleel. We allow them to enjoy for a short time their kufr. But we will grab them and they will wish. They will say, Ya laytani kuntu turaba. We wish we were dust. Hmm? We wish we were, we, we were not where we are now. Qaddamtu li hayati, they will say. Allah says, too late. Too late. Did no honor come to you? إِذَا أُلْقُوا فِيهَا سَمِعُوا لَهَا شَهِيقًا وَهِيَ تَفُورٌ تَكَادُ تَمَيَّزُ مِنَ الْغَيْظِ Allah says, when they are being ready to be thrown in hell, they will hear the roaring fire, the ghayz of the fire. Quran is describing in Surah Al-Mulk, see? مِنَ الْغَيْظِ And then the angels will ask, أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ نَذِيرٌ didn't a warner come to you? قَالُوا بَلَا قَدْ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالٍ كَبِيرٌ وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرٌ Quran says it elegantly. Who is going to enter hell? The ones who invoke the wrath of God? The Muawiyahs, the Yazids, and the Yazids of today who are financing the killing and the butchering of these groups of people who go and hit old men and kill their children and behead them and throw them. These are maghdubi alayhim. And what does this verse say? Didn't no warner come to you? They said, yes, but when it came, fires, فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا And we said, مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ بِنْ شَيْءٍ There was no revelation. They looked at the prophets and the imams and said, you are liars. They called our prophets and our imams liars. And they will say, If only we would have listened and paid attention, we would not have been the inmates of this fire of hell. So Allah is saying very categorically, no one enters hell unless they willfully work against the truth. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <clears throat> Please ask sisters to sit back so we can fit more people. I don't know what that means. Sit back? Why can't they move forward so that they can sit from the back? Yeah, they come in from here. So should, shouldn't they come forward? Okay. <laughs> Whatever works. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.
Thank you. Let me continue while this is settling down due to lack of time. I mentioned Hollywood, Iddalin. So the third group in Surah Al-Fatiha is the one that's lost. They're good, generally, people, but they don't know night from day. They don't know what's wrong and what's right and what's straight and what's crooked. They believe something is straight, but actually it's crooked. And they think something is crooked, but actually it's straight. That's Dalin. You and I should not follow those kinds of people. And if we do, we'll become like them. Our friends in school who entice us to do wrong things, the ones who use foul language in every other word, the ones who smoke, who drink, who are chasing girls and girls are chasing boys, the ones who are lewd, reckless morally, they have no time to think about why we exist, what we call visionless people, happy-go-lucky, live-by-the-day kind of people. We'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. A bird in one hand is better than ten in the bush, that kind. Dalin, beware of them. They are around us, they are within our families, they are within our communities, they are within our institutions, they are within our workforces. And you and I cannot avoid those quote-unquote bacteria that's harmful unless you and I immunize ourselves from them. And there is no way to immunize unless you and I know what's good and what's bad. As I mentioned in the health industry, in the fitness industry, the one who's very much in peak shape physically, the one who's got a very good physical endowment body-wise, and when you look at them, you say, MashaAllah, you are so well built. That person didn't get there haphazardly. They had a vision. And they maintain their vision because when you give them poisonous food, you will see they will not take it. And they are so aware of what's good and what's bad that when they go to the supermarket, they read the ingredients in the back. And they know what the carb to fiber ratios are. And they know what to read and they know what to avoid and how much carbs are good for them and what's not good for them. That little sample that I just gave you is just the material bodily functioning kind of example. What about my spirit? What about my humanity? You can be very well endowed, muscular, for example, or a woman in a very good physical state. It doesn't mean we're successful. Just because we are, you know, big pectorals and big biceps doesn't make us successful. That's just a physical outlook. But if the person's tongue is harsh, or they don't have good akhlaq, or they commit haram acts, they're ugly. Their ugliness is not in physical state, it's in the act of disobedience. It's in the act of doing the wrong things. Ugliness, by the way, is only when we disobey Allah. Not our physical state. Shaitan is a beautiful creation. He became ugly when he disobeyed Allah. Allah creates everything good. Became ugly because it disobeyed Allah. When you and I disobey Allah, we become ugly. We become like those creatures who will say, God forbid, We would not be these inmates of the fire. فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ Allah says in the same surah. They will recognize their evils. فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسُحْقًا لِأَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ Furthest are we from them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why? Because Allah says they disobeyed consistently while being warned over and over and over. They were like summum bukmun umyun. فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Deaf, dumb, and blind. And they had no common sense to use. There are people in this world who are like that. They cause a lot of damage and harm. So I'm going back to the original point. Vision, my brothers and sisters. Extremely important. Why are we here? When you look at children and you tell them, your goal in life is to have a vision. We don't encourage vision in our children these days. We encourage them short-term visions. I'm talking about long-term vision. Our vision usually is to impress a girl 
if it's a boy. It's amazing how we are, have this knee-jerk reaction, Pavlovian response, like the bell rings and you start to salivate. A group of brothers sitting, one sister walks in, the whole character changes. Everybody starts to become like a peacock. The feathers go up, <laughs> look at me. <laughs> I'm so good, aren't I? Impress, just impress. Same with sisters. Could be a group of sisters, one brother walks in, the whole attitude changes. Mashallah, it's good, at least you became aware. <laughs> uh, the point is, for what? Impress people. No one said don't impress. Impressing people is the act of a believer. To be upright and impressionable and to be desirable in a halal way is not haram. It's good. Allah says, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةُ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ Who made haram for you? The good things in this world. Huh? Allah says, زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّحَوَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاء Mankind is busy in the love of women, Quran says. Hmm? And gold and jewels and show-offs. That's the thing. Go to high schools. Go see high schools. Especially 11th, 12th graders. They can't wait to show off their cars. And they all have heavy feet. 10 feet, you got to accelerate 100 miles per hour. It's got to burn all the rubber. Why? I just want to let you know I'm cool. <laughs> Testosterone rich. <laughs> I'm tough. And the girl says, wow, you're so cool. And then she's dreaming about him and he's dreaming about her. All shallow, shallow, absolutely shallow substance, you know? This love business is so cheap today. Cheap. It's so meaningless today that it leads to all kinds of marital problems in the future. It leads to all kinds of destructions in the family. It shatters the foundation of children. And what happens with children? They start in a family that's earthquake zoned. And the child can never focus. There's no focus because the parents are so shifty. There's no foundation. And parents who don't play a critical role in, in inducing good focus and vision in the children results in bad output. The fruits are not good. If the roots are good, the fruits are good, as we say, right? You want to see the roots? Look at the fruits. Roots are hidden, you know that. Only fruits are visible. When our children have good akhlaq, good morals, upright. They don't talk nonsense. And while the world around them, the maghdubi alayhim and dhalin are busy throwing darts at them and poison at them, they're immunized and they know how to protect themselves because they have a vision with an amta alayhim, with the group that Allah has chosen. Hence these commemorations of Karbala. It's precisely to fo focus on this principle in the Quran. Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim. How do you do dhikr of an'amta alayhim if you don't have these great historical events that Allah sent them as role models for you and I to reflect upon? You see? Surah An-Nur. Allah says, Allah nur samawati wal ard. مثل نوره كمشكات فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب ذري يوكد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد ذيتها يضيء ولو لم تمتص لو لم تمسسه النار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس. This last part is beautiful. Those of you who've understood it, I'll translate briefly without taking too long. This verse requires hundreds of lectures. Just this one verse. It is one of the deepest verses in the Quran. Ayat nur in Surah An-Nur, the verse of light. And Allah uses the analogy of light because Allah is showing us metaphorically light gives, it guides. Our eyes cannot see without light. It needs one photon minimum to see. You deprive it one photon, it's utter darkness, you can't see. Your eye stops to function. 
and the photon gives, gives, doesn't take. So Allah's rahma is constant giving. Prophets are only giving. Imams are giving. They're very giving and forgiving. This is the akhlaq of Islam which we need to induce into our children's vision. That my son, I love when you give. My daughter, I love when you give. Be kind, be gentle, be caring, be sharing. Gain knowledge so you can share it. Protect the ummah and don't take things, meaning don't take the guidance away from them. Guide them, take them towards barakah. Do we teach that in our children these days? I have found majority of our problems in society is because parents, unfortunately, as good as they are, themselves were victims of very minimal vision, which sets this cyclical stage of perpetuating, of constantly promoting the same ritual of the past. Whereas by blessing, we, at least those of us who are living in the West, we have the opportunity to see other lifestyles and methodologies by which to approach success in a more practical way. So let's not shortchange ourselves. We are not a statistic. We are chosen, and of the billions of people, you and I are chosen to be here. And Allah has placed us here for a reason. And the reason is for us to reflect on the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this life is a test. This life is a trial. If you and I don't understand the gravity of the test, I'll give a simple example. When you say life is a test, you say, yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, life is a test, I know, I know. No, you don't know. You know when you know? I'll give you an example. You're sitting in class. This happens to me all the time when I'm teaching or when I'm discussing among the youth. Many youth come and say, brother, we're afraid of you. <laughs> so why are you scared of me? He says, we're afraid you, if, you do, if you pick on us. Maybe you'll pick me to ask me a question. Please don't pick on me. I said, why, you want to remain ignorant? He says, no, no, no. I feel embarrassed, you know. Yeah, because life is not a test at that moment. So when I look at a brother, he says, brother, what's your name? He says, uh, Hassan. What's this answer? <sighs> ya Allah, I'm going to die. <laughs> He's nervous, looking around, sweating. Ah, the test became real. You just got asked a question. And if you don't know the answer, you're going to look foolish. If you give the wrong answer, you're going to look foolish. Hopefully you'll give the right answer, then you'll be beaming like, I knew it all the time. It's a test. But notice that split moment when you were questioned, you felt very worried. You felt like, oh my God, how will I answer this question? I have to carefully think about this because this is a very critical moment. The crowd is here and I better give a good answer. It's like a sport, right? You have a ball in your hand. What are you going to do with it? Everybody's watching you. It's very important. Now, if you think about life holistically, at that split moment when someone asks you a question, guess what? That moment of being asked a question, is this life? From my birth to death to my realizations, it is this life that I'm worried that I have already been questioned. And the angels and Allah is listening and waiting for my answer. That attitude is different from saying, yeah, yeah, there's a test. We'll worry about it tomorrow. I am not in the test. No. Everybody is in the test. And Allah says in the Quran, you know, in so many verses, here, for example, we will test you with fear, loss of life, loss of fruits, loss of family, right? Rabashir is sabirin. Give good news to the patient ones. They say we are indeed from Allah and indeed we return to Allah. Why do they say that? Imagine when Allah is testing you with pain, loss, fear, lives. Karbala, ultimate example of this verse. You go back to this verse, it starts with, 
الصلاة إن الله مع الصابرين ولا تقول لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون You take just this verse and exemplify it in, in this vision of life You will see Karbala exemplifies all these great verses in the Quran. Karbala is the culmination of 124,000 prophetic missions in one day. That's how powerful it is. So going back to Surah An-Nur, Allah says, this light, مَثَلُ نُورِ كَمِشْكَاتٍ فِيهَا مِسْبَحْ It's like a niche wherein there is a lamp. And this lamp shines like stars. See? المصباح في زجاجة in glass الزجاجة كأنها كوكب like stars is كوكب meaning stars shining كوكب ذري يوكد من شجرة مباركة it comes from a blessed tree neither east nor west مبارك زيتون لا شرقية ولا غربية and the light that comes out of it comes from a blessed olive tree which has no fire in it وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَسْهُ نَارِ It's pure light. Very deep metaphors. Very deep. Niche. Special people. An amta alayhim. Glass means they're protected. Like shaitan says, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَغُوِ أَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ I will beguile them all except your protected ones. Who are the protected ones? These inside this glass. The glass sparkles like stars because they are brilliant. They're elegant. Nothing is more beautiful in our eyes at night than the stars. Elegant. There's something pleasing. People even put this glow in the dark stars in the room just to give that feeling like they're looking in the sky outside. Quran uses this. From a tree that's blessed. What's the tree? The tree of Adam, which is the tree of Ibrahim. It splits to Ismail and it splits to Ishaq. And from Ishaq comes Isa السلام, and all the Bani Israel prophets. And from Ismail comes Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the A'imma. Shajaratin Mubarakatin, Zaytunatin. لا شرقية بيا. Neither east nor west. Why? Because they are chosen. They are special. They were planted on earth, specially for you and me to guide us. الذي خلق فصوى والذي قدر فهدى. He creates and makes it complete. He gives it destiny and guides it. That guidance, فهدى, is this tree. And if this tree did not exist, our existence would be useless because there would be no trial. Why the trial, you might ask? Why is Allah testing me? Let me answer that very briefly without going too far into a tangent. You will notice that you and I will never know our own values, know those around us, except through trials. If you go on a vacation with a friend that you met and he's a good friend, to you is good. But you've never had a difficulty with this friend. It's always been rosy. Everything's been lovely. Life has just been dandy and rosy with this friend. I asked you, is that a good friend? I said, well, yeah. I said, no, you don't know. Why? Five years, we've been together. It's been wonderful, never a problem. No, you don't know if that's a real friend. Why? We never fought, five years, we're best friends. No, you don't know. You see, a friend in need is a friend indeed. <laughs> so how do you know your friend? You'll notice when problems come, when trials come, when there's fear, loss, shakiness. Then you look at your friend, are you with me? You will never know the value of a friend except under trials and tribulations. I challenge it. I say this even to non-Muslim audiences. Find the nature of God's creation. If it is not attainable to attain the truth, haq, from batil, except through trials and tribulations, how do you find out the true value? 
So when you go on a trip and there was a bala, there was a problem, you lost money, you got attacked, something wrong happened, and your friend was there to protect you, even to give his life or her life to save you, or they came out of, and they sacrificed and they gave themselves to you. Now someone says, how valuable is that friend? You say, priceless. Why? I tested this one. There was a test that took place. Many of my friends abandoned me. This one stood next to me. This must be my best friend. Notice there is no way to expose even our relationships, even couples, husband and wife. It's all about sacrifices. The word love is separated from the word sacrifice. You want to love somebody? Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Allah says to the believers, you claim to be, so Allah is saying to the Prophet, tell them, you claim to love God? إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي Then obey me, follow me. That sacrifice of a human being to say, I follow wholeheartedly with the Holy Prophet. And I avoid the haram, what he thought was haram, and said haram. And I make halal what he makes halal, because he is an amta alayhi. He is my agency. He is the one God has brought to give me good focus and vision. Then Allah says, and I love you. See? In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni, yuhbibkum Allah, wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. He will forgive you your mistakes, and he will protect you from future mistakes. This makes sense. So notice that our obedience to the Holy Prophet and the Imams, in this nur that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, is so pivotal and critical that I ask us all, and only through trials and tribulations. So when you, have a, you and I have problems in life, don't complain like, oh, Allah doesn't love me. Why this bala? You know, I'm having this problem. That's it. I'm not praying anymore. Why? Oh, I've been praying all my life. This is what God gives me after all my hajj and my ziyarat and all my prayers. I even do salat al -layl. I read Quran and I'm going through this problem. This God doesn't exist. Astaghfirullah. People say that. Oh, when someone dies... Allah, why did you take him? Allah, why didn't you take me? It's just an expression of love, I know. But don't say that. Say, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Ridham bi kada. We're happy, Allah. Whatever you chose, you decided to take the loved one before me. No problem. I will to you. I'll come closer to you. But if we say to Allah, why did you take him? It's like saying to Allah, you made a mistake. You should have asked me. Who does that? When we go to Karbala and see, tonight I'll talk about Qasim ibn al-Hassan, a young boy, son of Imam Hassan, barely of tender age of 11, 10, 11 years of age. Imam lets him go. You know, when I'm reading these stories, I'm thinking, blessed Imam, what kind of a vision must you have had as the uncle of this child whose father was poisoned? What kind of a vision did you have to watch this tender little boy running towards the field? That while he's going to get butchered, you watched him. By what authority did you watch him, Ya Imam? Why did you allow this child to go? Because the wish of Imam Hassan it was his wish. What kind of a father wishes his 10-year-old in child to go on the battlefield among these Heathens, kafirin, munafiqeen, who are brutal. The Imam says it's a trial. This world is a trial. It will end. What better than to die with dignity and honor? What better than to raise children who give their souls for God? That's love. This dunya is short. Live it to the max. Multiply it to the max. Acquire wealth if you want it, and you can use it for Allah, to the max. Billions, no problem. But Allah says, use it for me. Do it for me. Allah doesn't need it. When he says, do it for me, he's actually saying, for you. But do it the right way. Don't make you the goal, Allah says. Make me the goal, then you live forever. 
We don't understand. We think when we pray to Allah, we've done him a favor. No. Allah says, when you prayed, you prayed for yourself. In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. When you did good, you did good for yourselves. When you maintain salah, it wasn't for me. Allah says, inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Wala dhikrullahi akbar. Prayer keeps you from wrongdoing and evil. And it is a great worship. Why is Allah saying great worship? It keeps you upright. In what way? It gives you a vision. Gives you a focus. When we talk about salah, I'll talk about it in the next few nights. I need to repeat this all the time. Because we need this reminder. Salah. It is the focal point of a believer. Why? The enemy may say, look at you going up and down, up and down. What is this? Up and down five times a day. What is this? 17 times you go up and down. Okay, isn't one time enough? You have to do 17 times. You say, go to player. Hey, you threw the ball in the basket. Isn't one time enough? So you got a shot. Now go home. He says, are you crazy? Practice makes perfect. I'll do it infinite times till I perfect it. So why do we apply those rules in games when a person practices daily? We say, bravo, bravo, bravo. But when this one is practicing daily salah, ignorant, ignorant, ignorant. Why? Salah for us, what does it do? Imam Khomeini, rahmatullahi alayhi, hit it on the nail. When he was seen praying relatively fast, and he was asked, you're praying relatively fast. He says, prayer begins when it ends. I've mentioned this many times before. This thing, this sentence struck me. And I mentioned this, it made me dizzy for a moment. It, I thought it was a riddle. <laughs> what does that mean? It begins when it ends. This is sort of like a paradoxical statement. No. Then it struck me, subhanAllah, he's right. What I just did at Fajr time in Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha was my reenactment of my vision of what I am going to do, of what I have prayed to Allah for. I said it. Allah says, now you finished your salam, now go practice it. So salah actually begins when it ends. Salawat Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad. This is the vision. So when we talk about vision, it's a long story. Vision simply means, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? Is this life a trial? It is. And if you're not, you and I are not ready to receive trials and tribulations, not foolish ones, not where we do haram things and then we end up in prison. You say, ah, it was meant to be, you know, I'm supposed to go to jail. No. Or I robbed some money, I got caught. Oh, well, it's a trial, you know, I had to go to jail. No, not that. That's foolishness. That's not trial. That's putting yourself in harm. Trial is you're constantly struggling to maintain the good path, but the enemy is constantly striking you. I know in public life, when we speak, media, you think the spies are not here to listen to us? Of course they are. They listen to everything. These videos are out there. They're not being monitored. Of course they are. Who is this guy? What is he saying? Why did he say this? Let's monitor. You start hitting the nerve hard enough and you start becoming too effective, you think the enemy is going to go to sleep? No. <laughs> you find great scholars were shot at and killed. Shaheed Mutahari, you know, Rahmatullahi Ali. He was killed, shot. Why? Too powerful, too effective, too intelligent. How many attempts were made on our ulama and fuqaha? How many times our scholars were attacked? only to be destroyed, to be killed. Why? They're too powerful. Excellent example, our prophets and imams. How many of them were killed and butchered and beheaded hmm? and stabbed and burnt? The story is replete, filled. Prophets and imams, constant. You find our imams, even as the later periods came, the Abbasid periods came, our imams were being killed at a younger age. This silent killer called poison. Why was Imam Hassan poisoned? Muawiyah said he's too effective. Why did Mamun kill Imam Rada? Too effective. Imam Rada would not stop talking haq. Too powerful. Aha, you strike a nerve. 
Yes, the enemy says, I can't handle this guy. That's different. That's a person who says, I came to be upright. I came to live upright. I came to die upright. What good is it for me to be loved by the world when I'm a treacherous, wretched person, wealthy, living in palatial homes? But what good is it that I have to go answer my Lord tomorrow? This is the vision we are talking about. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So let me focus on the verse I started. Surah Al Imran, verse number 104. وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَعْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَائِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And from among you there should be a party who invite to good and join what is right, forbid the wrong. These are the ones who will be successful. These are the ones who are successful. Our obligation, promote good, forbid evil. Then we are successful. How do we promote good? How do we forbid evil? Needs a template. It needs a vision. It needs guidance. Simple introduction. Simple introduction. You and I must have firm grip on Usul al-Din. Please. You might ask me, brother, what's, this is great. What you just said is right. But how, how, how? I'm telling you, if you and I do not indulge that fantastic gray matter that lies in our heads, if you and I do not indulge in it, and reflect with it, we will be losers. Imam al makes a very profound statement in Nahjul Balagha. He says there are three kinds of people in this world. The learned, the ones who know, the learners, the ones who are learning, the students, and the rubbish. There's only three groups of people. So what is Allah saying to us through the Imam? Either you are teaching, or you are learning, Oh, you're wasting your time. So when you and I dangle in society five years, ten years later, and when we ask some basic fundamental questions about why we exist, and we don't know the answer because we've been so busy chasing our tails in the dark, then Allah on judgment they will ask us, this trial wasn't important to you? It's like that reckless student who goes to the exam, you know? Classic example. A student who goes to school, hasn't studied, doesn't care about the grade. Sits, the test comes, he's cool as a cucumber. He's taking his exam, doesn't care. Takes his time, hasn't prepared. Puts all wrong answers, doesn't put any answers. Gives it, gets a zero. Doesn't care. Can anybody in society rationally tell you this is a good act? No. Why not? Because this is a reckless individual. Careless. Whereas they should have studied to take this exam. In fact, they should have studied so well that if the exam has 60 questions and there's 60 minutes, they should have broken it down to one minute minimum per question or maximum per question. One minute maximum per question. Aha, uh -huh, that's rational dissection of my life on a day-to-day -day basis. I use this example many times. Now examine. If you went into an exam and the teacher told you there is an exam, but you don't know how long it is. So when I put the paper on the desk for you, upside down, the exam doesn't start. The minute you flip it over, the exam starts. But when you flip it over and the exam starts, I will not tell you when the exam will end. I will randomly take the paper away from you. How would you feel? All of us, we've done some kind of studying and schooling. How would you feel? Forget about the 60 minutes and the one minute per question. Forget it. Now you are so zoned in that every second is critical to answer the, as many questions as right as possible before the paper is pulled. That's life. Allah says, you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know which land you will die. How do you know when you're going to die? In Allah, in the ilm to God is the knowledge of time. How do you know when you're going to die? So Allah says, imagine this examination where you are being tested and you don't know when the end. And we're reckless and we haven't gained knowledge and we haven't focused on our aqidah, focused on why we exist. We haven't focused on Allah, who is Allah, that if an atheist comes and asks us a question that I don't believe in your God, can you prove it to me? You say, it's in here, I can't tell you. Many of us say, it's in here, it's in here, but I can't tell you. 
So the guy says, well, if it's in there, give it to me. I can't. Well, that's a problem. Because if it's in here, that means we haven't spent time to think about it. That's why we can't give it. If we thought about it, it's easy to give. But we don't. How many of us know the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha? If you take the Muslim population, it's a minority. Fatiha. Ten times a day Muslims repeat this formula. Ten times a day for those of us who pray. Ask the general Muslim mass, what does it mean? Hmm? This verse is I just recited. What does it mean? People say, we don't know. Many times people don't know. I said, how amazing. We're talking to Allah. We don't know what we're saying. If our non-Muslim friends came and asked us, what did you just say? We said, I don't know. How embarrassing is that? Leave that embarrassment alone. What about Allah on Judgment Day? He says, you kept speaking to me. You didn't know what you were saying? Oh, it was in here, Allah. Is that how it works? It doesn't work that way. So, Amr bil ma'roof, aqeedah. Belief in Day of Judgment, extremely important. If you condense it, you'll find Allah, Day of Judgment. If you extract it, Allah, Nubuwa, Day of Judgment. Further extraction. Why Nubuwa? Nubuwa validates the exam, validates the Day of Judgment. Day of Judgment is useless if not for teachers. You can't have an exam without a teacher. You extract Nubuwa further, you have Imamat in it. By the way, Imamat is inside Nubuwa. It's not separate. When you say Ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah, when you say it, when you bear witness to that, when you say that, you have actually now to submit entirely to the will of Rasulullah. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah says, "An-Nabiyyu awla bil-mu'minina min anfusihim." The Messenger, the Prophet, has greater right on the believers than the believers have on themselves. It doesn't mean I take 10% of my profit, 90% I ignore him. Allah says you can't take part. It's all or none. So when you and I take the profit, then you and I are going to follow whatever he wants. You and I are going to obey whatever he wants. And if you and I say, I take you up to here, then I ignore you, Allah says no problem. You are still a Muslim, but you could be a Fasiq. Fasiq is one, is one who creates trouble. One who's munafiq. What, mean, what does it mean? His heart is really not there. He's saying it with his words. What does it mean? Full submission of, of what is khushu. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ What is khushu? Complete submission. So, if you and I don't know the story of Karbala, you and I don't know why Karbala took place, then let me start it by saying the Prophet said, I appoint Ali ibn Abi Talib, مَنْ كُنْتُمْ مَوْلَى فَهَذَا عَلِيُ الْمَوْلَى Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man a'da. Wansur man nasara wa khudul man khadala. This is the work of the Prophet. The Prophet says, Ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha. Wa man arad al madina fa li ahtiha min babiha. I am the city, Ali is the gate. Whoever wants a city, come to the gate. You disobey this, your nubuwa is shaky. You start bargaining here and admitting other extraneous personalities into the equation, you are challenging Allah and the Prophet. That's the discussion we're having tonight. All these discussions, this is at the center of our trials. The minute you and I are able to focus on this, and I'm not saying those who don't focus on this are wrong, or they're, you know, they're going to hell. I'm not saying that. I'm saying those who have not found it, it's our job to tell them. But at the end of the day, what is really under trial? Promotion of good, forbidden of evil. But the perfect promotion of good, forbidden of evil, is when our aqidah, our usul al deen is perfected. Imam Hussain alayhi salam shows us the following. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. As you know, before he left, to go to Mecca. Muawiyah just died in, in Rajab. And right away, the governor of Medina wanted the bay'ah of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And that same night, two days before the end of Rajab, Imam Hussein takes his family and leaves to go to Mecca. Why Mecca? Because it's Balad al Amin. It is a city protected. And Imam takes protection in Mecca. And then as you know, when he leaves, before he leaves, 
he talks to his brother, stepbrother, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. Okay? Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. And he talks to him, and he leaves him a will. I want to read this will tonight, within the time that I have. Imam says, Hada ma awsa bihil Hussein ibn Ali ila akhihi Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. I'll translate this. I just want to read the Arabic. Those of you who know it, Alhamdulillah. أن الحسين يشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. Look at how Imam is writing his will. There's a lesson in it. Why am I reading this will this way? There's a lesson in it. Pay attention. You will see what I mean. أن الحسين he says, I am Hussein. يشهد I bear witness أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. There is no association with Allah. Notice his will is beginning with what? Aqeedah. It's beginning with what? Usul al-Deen. What kind of Usul al-Deen? Clear vision. Why am I doing this? What's my purpose? Why do I exist? Why am I important? Why am I living? Why am I going to die? If you and I don't know that, I promise us all, we will cheat, we will lie, we will rob. We will not believe in Yawm Al-Qiyamah. We will be doing haram things because we don't believe Allah sees us. And we don't believe that God is going to hold us liable. He says, وَأَنْ عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ جَاءَ بِالْحَقِّ مِنْ عِنْدِي The truth, the prophet is the messenger of God. وَأَشْحَدُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ I bear witness, Muhammad is the messenger, is the servant and the messenger of God. وَأَنَّ Listen to this. جَنَّةَ حَقٌ وَالنَّارَ حَقٌ I bear witness. Paradise is true. Hell is true. And the day of judgment will come, and there is no doubt in it. Hmm? Listen to what Imam is saying now. فالله أولى بالحق ومن رد علي هذا أصبر حتى يقضي الله بيني وبين القوم وهو خير الحاكمين وهذه وصيتي إليك يا أخي وما توفيقي إلا بالله عليه توكلت إيه أنيب. إمام حسين عليه السلام says the following as I mentioned. He says, Allah will bring the dead to life for sure. He says, this movement of mine is not because I am stubborn, not because I am rebellious, not because I am worldly for possession, nor am I creating instigations, fitna by shaitan. It is also not my object to create trouble or to oppress anyone. Imam's will. He's telling us why he is going to... Karbala, why he's going to Kufa. He says, the only thing which invites me to this great movement is that I should reform the affairs of the followers of my grandfather, eradicate corruption, undertake enjoining to do good and restraining from evil and follow the tradition of my grandfather, the Prophet of Allah, and my father Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salawat Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad. This is the mission of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He continues. He says, I have come out to reform the followers of my grandfather. If the people respond to my call and accept truth from me, well and good. And if they don't accept it, I shall observe patience and I am not afraid of unpleasant events. Look at the quality. Nurun ala nur. Light upon light. Yahdillahu li nurihi man yasha. He guides to this light whoever he wants. He says, I'm not afraid of unpleasant events, hardships, 
nor sufferings. He says, oh, my brother, this is my testament for you. I don't seek assistance from anyone except Allah. Why? Because Allah says, in yansurukum Allah, فَلَا غَالِبَ لَكُمْ وَإِنْ يَخْذَلْكُمْ فَمَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ When God helps you, no one can defeat you. And if he doesn't help you, who is there to defeat you? He says, I depend on him alone, and to him I return. Tonight, I end with this mission of Imam Hussein. We'll continue to talk about this objectiveness that you and I also need to do this. There's a hadith I will read tomorrow. I don't have time. I see the time is eaten away. But the messenger in gist says there will come a time haram will be halal and halal will be haram. He says our women will be running rampant. There will be free sexuality. Men will be running rampant. And the companion said, really? Ya Rasulullah, this will happen? The Prophet said, yes. He says, then my son, my grandson will come and he will establish focus again for the ummah to raise them, elevate them. So these remembrances tonight are to incite in our hearts, how can we be upright? Imam Hussain, when he enters Karbala, as you know, he takes the son of Imam Hassan with him. His mother was there too. She's known as Umm Farwa. She was the wife of Imam Hassan. These women, subhanallah, we'll talk about them from tomorrow onwards. Zainab alayha salam, subhanallah. Okay, you look at the women that were in Karbala, Rabab, the wife of Imam Hussein, Umm Farwa, the wife of Imam Hassan. These were extraordinary women. Imam took them because they are the media. The media of Islam is generally the women. That hijab is media. The mouthpiece, you might think, no, us men, we're the one who are talking. No, women, they carry something so powerful, they carry the flag of Islam. The mother of Qasim was there. She adored this young 10-year-old boy. But Imam Hassan had advised her, there will come a time when my brother will be asking Hal min Nasrin, Yan Saruna, who is there to help me. He says, I want my young son also to be sacrificed for his cause. Imam Hassan also had an older son who became martyred in Karbala. You find Qasim ibn al-Hassan on the day of Ashura, all the companions have been killed. Abbas has become shaheed. Ali Akbar has become shaheed. Everybody with Imam Hussein has become shaheed. And this young boy, valiant 10-year-old, says, I want to go also to defend you, my uncle. Imam looks at him with tears of sadness. He says, first my brother was madhloom with poison that even pieces of his intestines came out because of the poison. Now you have to go and I have to witness this. This little boy was known as Qamare Bani Hashim. Why? Because he was like the moon of Banu Hashim. Qasim comes to his uncle and says, I am ready to go to fight. Now, Qasim was only young. He had never fought in a battle. So he wasn't armored. He was with sandals. He was carrying a big sword, dragging it. Look at the zeal of a 10-year-old. Imam is saying, take lesson on you 10-year-olds. That as much as I'm giving my nephew to the front lines, I'm giving him for you. Don't get lost when you're 10 years old. Raise your children like 10 years old, like Qasim was raised with Hassan and Imam Hussein. Qasim goes to his father, to his uncle, I mean, and says, takes permission. Some historians say that Imam Hassan had written a letter. I doubt my son to come with you, then I, your brother, command you to <laughs> Imam gives him permission. Historians say as he's walking, his left sandal, the strap was unhooked. It was dragging on the sand. Imam stops him and goes down on his feet and he ties the sandals. Historians say, look at the Imam. He's now on the verge of massacre. All his companions have been killed. His family members have been butchered. This blessed Imam is worrying about a sandal because the Imam is saying, this is not what we worry about. It's the art and the way we approach this enemy to hold upright. The vision of Islam is important to us. 
that Imam did not make a single mistake in all of the events of Karbala. Tomorrow we'll describe more of how the Imam dealt with the enemy and the sentences he uttered. But tonight, understand the Imam is saying, I've gone to promote good. And this little boy goes forward. They said, Amr bin Nufail sees this little boy approaching. And by the way, Qasim was not riding a horse, historians say. He was on foot. He ran towards the enemies. And as he's running, Amr bin Nufail sees him. He says, Wallah, I want to kill that boy. Young boy, you want to kill him? How wretched you are. Qasim comes forward and he's striking with his sword. He injures soldiers. And then Amr bin Nufail strikes him. And strikes him and Qasim falls from the, on the ground. And he calls, Ya Ammo. Assalamu alaikum Ya Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Imam Hussein swoops like a lion to this little boy and holds him. And Amr, as he's striking, Imam takes his sword and severs the arm of Amr bin Nufail and he drags and he runs away. Imam holds his little boy, soulless, dead, shaheed, and he brings him back. That vision I want us to lock into our hearts. How does that mother who's opening the tent, Umm Farwa, seeing this blessed Imam bringing this little child forward and says, Here, he has sacrificed for the cause of goodness. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let's recite three times Amma Yujib. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amma Yujibu al-Muthtarra idha da'a wa yakshifu al-Su. Amma Yujibu al-Muthtarra idha da'a wa yakshifu al-Su. Amma Yujibu al-Muthtarra idha da'a wa yakshifu al-Su. Salawat al Muhammad. Thank you, Brother Hassanayn, for enlightening us 